23andMe is confirming reports of user data theft via a credential stuffing attack. Hackers have already released 1 million lines of data targeting Ashkenazi Jews based on their DNA test information. And a dark money political group is trying to stop you from encrypting your own iPhone. Lots to talk about this week, so let's get into it. I'm Matt Johansson, this is Vulnerable You. I'm gonna give you everything you need to know from the cybersecurity headlines this week in about 10 minutes. First up is 23andMe. If you don't know what credential stuffing is, it's when hackers take username and password combinations from a bunch of different data breaches and then use that to brute force various websites and apps. The bet they're making is that people use the same username and password combination across a bunch of different websites. That bet generally pays off, a lot of people do. This is why us security folks preach using password managers or some other technique to be able to use a long, random, and unique password for every different website and app that you use. It's also another reason we constantly preach two-factor authentication. But that's just what happened to 23andMe this week. They let hackers use usernames and passwords from other data breaches to get into 23andMe accounts. So 23andMe's servers weren't technically hacked, but their user accounts were. Once the hackers were in the stolen accounts, they used the DNA relatives features to map the details of all sorts of users. But unfortunately, their first target was Ashkenazi Jews and people of Chinese descent. They took to some shady underground forums to try to leak this information and drum up interest from buyers. Spokespeople from 23andMe are sticking to the line that they didn't get hacked but they confirm the legitimacy of the data that the hackers are leaking. This brings the question, is credential stuffing actually a data breach? The argument from the companies is that the onus is on the users to not reuse usernames and passwords. I'd argue the company isn't helpless here. There's lots you can do to protect against credential stuffing attacks. You ever log into an account from a new device and it says, hey, we don't recognize this device. Let's send you a text message or an email or a phone call to verify that that is you. You can do that with new devices or even geolocation. Companies can even put a CAPTCHA on a login if there's too many failed attempts. This drives up the cost of brute forcing. Either way, this one is a combination data breach and a hate crime, which is causing it to garner a lot of attention. Even me just talking about it on the internet made all sorts of people come out of the woodwork that I don't really like in my mentions. If you think you've been impacted by this data breach, stay safe out there. Our next story is the latest in a long fight against our right to privacy and encryption. There's a new group attacking Apple and iPhone encryption, and it's backed by all sorts of political dark money. I've said this before, and I'm sure I'll say it again. There's no way to break encryption just for the good guys. That's just not how math works. If you create a backdoor, there is a backdoor now. Also, the air quotes around good guys are doing some pretty heavy lifting here if we're talking about law enforcement on this topic. They've proven time and time again, they, they will misuse these privileges to do things like stalk their exes or misuse this capability in some sort of divorce or personal affair. But in this latest story, there's a new nonprofit called the Heat Initiative. They were just formed earlier this year and their main campaign is against Apple and the use of encryption. The group says that Apple's privacy protections help enable child exploitation, objecting to the fact that pedophiles can encrypt their personal data just like everybody else. There's a big question about who the HEAT initiative is, and a lot of their funding comes from a group called the Hopewell Fund, which is tied to all sorts of political dark money. This raises a lot of questions about the true motive behind this group and if it's really to protect children. This campaign's push for Apple to weaken its encryption would have far-reaching impacts about users' privacy. This would open the door for all sorts of mass surveillance and potential misuse from either hackers or authoritarian governments. This is just the latest attempt to undermine cryptography and privacy rights. And once again, they're using the think of the children emotional approach to get people on their side. This latest push included a full page New York Times ad, a plane pulling a banner over Apple headquarters and several billboards. Talk about political dark money. I think Matthew Green said it best. He's one of the top cryptography experts. And I quote, I'm uncomfortable with anonymous rich people with unknown agendas pushing these massive invasions of our privacy. In the hierarchy of human privacy, your private files and photos should be your most important confidential possessions. We even wrote this into the US Constitution. Side note, I hate that I can't say crypto anymore because all the Bitcoin people stole it. I have to say cryptography every time now. I'm gonna keep watching this one, but as you can tell, I'm team privacy. Speaking of the good guys misuse of our private data, Google has received a record number of search warrants in the past 12 months, and they've complied with about 80% of them. That record is 60,472 if you're curious. However, what I'm concerned about is the broad nature of these warrants. An investigation has shown that most of the data that's returned to police 
is data connected to nobody that has anything to do with any crime. I wanna know a few things. Why do we have a record number of these requests this year? What's changed about law enforcement's practices to over rely on Google data? Also, where do we draw the line on ensuring public safety or protecting individual privacy? I'd like to see this process redesigned. How could we refine these data asks to minimize the splash damage on people that have nothing to do with what the police are after. This could help minimize potential harm, wrongful accusations, or even police misuse of this data. This is a tricky topic. Let me know in the comments of what you think of where this line should be drawn. Targeting elderly people and robbing them of their life savings is just the lowest of the low. And yet the FBI warned this week that phantom hacker scams targeting elderly are on the rise. Here's how these scams generally work. You get a phone call, the person's pretending to be tech support of some kind. They need access to your computer. They convince you to install something that lets them get remote access to your computer. At that point, they generally figure out a way to get into your bank account from your own computer and observe all your finances. Then they'll edit the screen to make it look like they've given you money or something like that, or that your computer is infected by a hacker. These scams make me super angry, and I love YouTube accounts and Twitch streamers that just waste these scammers time. If you've never watched these other accounts like Scammer Payback or Kitboga, I suggest you check them out. I've even seen my friend John Hammond getting involved with them. Friend of the show, love his content, great for learning new hacking techniques. Anyway, we're familiar with these scams, but the FBI is currently warning that these are on the rise, not on the downfall. You'd think that a lot of the education, the telcos warning you that this might be a spam call, and these other YouTubers might have been having a dent, but it seems these scammers are still successful because they just keep going after it. Two things to watch out for here. They target the vulnerable, and this trend is on the rise. They use scare tactics and emotional heartstrings that they can pull to convince our elderly relatives to let them into their computer. All we can do is do our part to raise awareness and up the stakes and drive up the cost for these attackers in succeeding. All right, there was just too many stories to fit into 10 minutes this week, so let's run through a bunch of them really quick. But first, a lot of you are reaching out to me and giving me good feedback about these 10 minute videos on Twitter and LinkedIn. If you could leave some comments here and help boost the YouTube algorithm, I'd really appreciate it. Like, subscribe, turn on alerts, share the video, all that jazz. Let's get into it. All right, we finished Hot Girl Summer, now it's Hot O'Day Fall. There's a pile of O'Days this week. Let's run through a bunch of them. Cisco emergency responder has static credentials vulnerability. This would allow an unauthenticated remote attacker to log into the device using the root account, which has default static credentials that cannot be changed or deleted. All right, iOS 17 came out like what, two weeks ago? It's already got a zero day and it's already being actively exploited. Apple's report was super vague, but they mentioned active exploitation. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see a report coming out of Citizen Lab in the next few weeks, because that just seems to be what happens every month now. Qualcomm patches three zero days that were all reported by Google. Those three zero days were among two dozen other vulnerabilities that went out this week in patches by Qualcomm. Vulnerabilities were identified in super micro BMCs that could allow for unkillable server rootkits. There's a report with seven high severity exploits in BMCs, which are the chips on the server's motherboard that allow for remote management of servers. These vulnerabilities can be exploited to gain control of the servers, and one of them can even allow malicious code execution inside the BMC. For all you AI hackers out there, I'm sure you've heard of PyTorch. Well, guess what? There's a vulnerability and it's even got some branding. It's called ShellTorch. Oligo Security has identified multiple critical vulnerabilities in TorchServe, a widely used PyTorch model server. These vulnerabilities can lead to a full chain of remote code execution. All right, I'm sure I'm even leaving out some zero days, but those are the big ones. Here's some news on some data breaches that we've talked about already. Sony got breached during the Move It breach that we talked about back in May. They just confirmed it this week in October. The Klopp ransomware group has been busy for months and Sony was just one of the victims. There's about 6,800 people's data that was compromised as part of this breach. We talked about the Clorox breach last week and it seems the attackers that were responsible for that are the COM, the same group responsible for the MGM and Caesars hacks. I'm seeing some financials come out in filings by Clorox and MGM and it's not pretty. MGM looks like they've lost about $110 million due to this breach. 10 million of that is just in incident response costs. Congrats, Mandiant. Clorox earning per share have gone through the floor. We generally see these things bounce back after a breach, but Clorox's supply chain was impacted for days. All right, I think that's enough news this week. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned next week for another 10 minutes of everything you need to know in cybersecurity on Vulnerable You.